It's a great pleasure to give a lecture here to the Kazakhstan uh, audience. I'm actually not too far. I was born not too far away from Kazakhstan. I'm from Iran originally. So it's a, uh, it gives me great pleasure to give a talk here, uh, which to a neighboring country kind of is close enough. Uh, I wish I can physically visit Kazakhstan because I've heard so many nice things about your country. At any rate, I am happy here to give a virtual lecture on physics. Um, I hope uh, we can have an interactive session. And if you do not mind, please turn on your videos. But if you don't want to do it, that's OK, too. Um, OK, so let's see. Uh, let me now change my background to a more suitable background related to my talk. And so you can see my presentation. I assume that now you can see my presentation. Is that the case? Yes, it yes looks everybody great. can see it. Perfect. Okay, yes. so um, so I'm going to talk about. So I'm assuming the the audience is not necessarily physics concentrators. There's, there could be some physicists, but I'm assuming. It's a broader audience, and so I'm going to gear my discussion to people who are interested in science and physics, but not necessarily physicists. I hope that's the correct assessment of the audience. And I'm going to ask you questions during the, during the talk, meaning I want to get your help in solving some of the puzzles. So um, this is based on a book that I have just published called Puzzles to Unravel the Universe. And it's related to a course I've been teaching for about past 10 years at Harvard University for the freshmen who are not decided to study physics yet, who are interested in different fields, but specifically interested in math and physics. And so here I use mathematical puzzles to try to explain some of the principles of physics. So that is the aim of this course. So my hope is to convey that many beautiful things in physics can be illustrated and better understood through simple math puzzles. Math and physics have, a, have had a beautiful history and beautiful interaction over many, many years. Uh, well, from some of the highlights from the past include the Greek mathematicians and philosophers uh, where they talked about math and geometry as trying to be connected to the basic ingredients of nature and the fundamental, uh, fundamental aspects of nature. So in particular, they studied platonic solids and they thought that these must be somehow representing the basic ingredients in the world. And they, for example, identified octahedron with the air, cube with the earth and so forth. Ancient Indian mathematicians and Chinese mathematicians and scientists and Islamic scientists and others continued this tradition um, by in various different kinds of scenarios and basically trying to understand how uh, one can understand you know, the planetary motions or how does the moon, phases of the moon work relative to the sun or how you can measure the radius of the earth simply by going on a mountain and looking at the horizon and measuring angles and measuring heights of the mountain. So from these kinds of ideas, they came up with methods to, to measure the radius with unprecedented accuracy. They even measured the height of the atmosphere. Now, you might think that the height of the atmosphere must be very hard to measure, and they must have you know, had some kind of a rocket or something going to the space to measure it. But no, this was measured about a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago, it was measured. And the you way you think that the height of the atmosphere was simply as follows. They noticed that when the sun sets, after the sun goes down, uh, the, the sky doesn't get immediately dark. And they said, well, the reason it doesn't get dark is that if the sun is here, it still gets to the air above us. And so it lightens up or brightens up the sky above us. Even though we cannot see the sun directly, we can still see the rays that affect the sky above us. But if the sun goes down further down, after a while, you cannot even see the last ray because the last ray even doesn't get to us. 
and therefore the sky gets completely dark. So the time it takes for the sun to set to the time it gets to be totally dark, it, as a measure of, of the rate, as, as a measure of 24 hours, that fraction is related uh, to, a, to a relation between the height of the atmosphere and the radius of the earth. And using that, they measured the radius, the height of the atmosphere. Very simple but brilliant observation. More, more modern times had to wait for more advanced mathematics uh, to have a more uh, detailed and quantitative measurement of uh, physics and nature, and in particular, the work of Newton, which related calculus and laws of mechanics. So he invented calculus to try to describe Gauss, a prominent mathematician who was also very interested in physics, he thought perhaps our universe is non-Euclidean. Maybe if you go on top of mountains, and if you measure the, uh, measure the angles that the big triangle makes by, by, by defining the lengths of the triangles as the path that the light ray takes, maybe the angles that you measure won't add up to 180 degrees. So these were the kind of questions that mathematicians began asking about relations between geometry and physics. Maxwell studied electricity and magnetism captured by beautiful differential equations and his famous equations capture uh, remarkable features of electricity and magnetism and their, the fact that they are related to each other and the fact that light can be generated by oscillating electric and magnetic fields propagating in space. Riemann, again, the first rate mathematician who described the Riemannian geometry, thought that perhaps that can be used to unify electricity and magnetism with gravity. Einstein was the actual person who managed to connect Riemannian geometry to physics using three plus one dimensional picture where the three dimensional space and the time get combined to a space time. And he came up with the equations to describe the relation between matter and curvature of space. In other words, he, he kind of explained how if you have like earth, how the geometry near it is curved and the distances between points near earth are not the standard distances that you naively think, but they're kind of distorted by the presence of the matter. Kaluza and Klein notice that if you add an extra dimension to three, namely make it four plus one dimension, and take this extra dimension to be tiny, like a little circle, then you can unify gravity with electricity and magnetism. So these are some basic areas of my research. It brings it to my, brings it back, brings this to my area of research, which is called string theory. Now, the aim of string theory is to unify fundamental forces and particles into one framework. So it's a very ambitious project. It's trying to give a fundamental description of all the forces. It aims to describe physics from the smallest possible scales, a trillionth of a trillionth of the size of an atom, all the way up to the size of the whole universe, so from the tiniest to the biggest. And the basic idea is simple. It simply suggests that the fundamental particles are actually not point-like, but extended objects, rather, rather like strings or membranes. So in string theory, we replace up particles like quarks and we view them as extended one-dimensional objects and perhaps higher dimensional objects called strings. It turns out doing this resolves an inconsistency between quantum theory which we know describes the microscopic physics with Einstein's theory of gravity. And the strings interact by combining and joining in this form. The two strings come and they join and these interactions describe all the forces in nature, including gravity, electromagnetic forces and all the forces by these simple diagrams. And these diagrams are called the pairs of pants diagram because they look like a pair of pants. 
So, so some simple picture like this can actually come to illustrate amazing fundamental forces in the nature. Now, this area of mine is very mathematical and it involves abstract ideas. Dimension of space is more than three plus one in string theory. In fact, in some corners of string theory, it's nine spatial dimensions plus one. The shape and size of the other tiny extra six dimension that, that we have to go from three to nine, these six extra dimensions will be typically tiny and small. And depending on their shape and size, they will affect what we see in our big universe. Strings wrapped around these tiny dimensions about how black holes work, how the beginning of the universe comes about, etc. So we think about the space as three big large dimensions, like these directions over here. And then we also have these little tiny six-dimensional space here. I'm denoting it like a sphere at top of each point. My aim in this talk, for the rest of the talk, is to show that the highly mathematical aspects of string theory, which is typical of many attempts to connect physics with reality, can also be illustrated by simpler ideas. Deep physical ideas have simple mathematical underpinning, and they can be illustrated by simple puzzles. We should not be fooled by the fact that the puzzles look almost childish. They might appear to us to be like, like a kid's play, but actually they are very deep. And so my point of this whole talk is to try to convince you that puzzles that might look or appear to be very elementary or boring are actually could be very deep illustrations of basic facts of the universe. I'm only gonna give some examples, clearly I cannot do more, but but one thing that can be done is that through these puzzles, perhaps I can get you to participate in the lecture as well. So the system is virtual, but I do need your participation. So I'm going to start my puzzles by first talking about symmetry and conservation laws, the power of symmetry and conservation laws. And to study this one, I'm going to start with a, um, with a um, with some some situation where we can actually um, uh, illustrate it. Oops, let me go back. So here we have two containers, a green and a white container. We take a glass and put some of the green paint into the white paint, and then stir it, and then take the same amount from the mixture with the same amount and put it back here. And then we stir it. Okay, I hope, I hope this is clear to everybody. Yes? Okay, good. Now, let's see. So the question is, which container has the higher concentration of the other color? In other words, we started with equal volumes, one of green and one of white. We took some from green and put it into the white container. And then we took the same amount, but now from the mixture and put it back into the green container. Now, um, I, think, I think I will activate the chat. Is the chat on? Can everybody see the chat? Yes, can you? I want everybody to give an answer via the I'm chat. On uh, white. Uh, so, so uh, just one second, uh, Mayor Jean. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody to answer. So the way we're going to ask is this. Those who think that the green container has more white, write G. Those who think that the white container has more green in it, write W in the chat. So again, let me repeat it. Those who think that the green container has more white, write G, and those who think that the white has more green, write W, and those who think they are equal, write E. Okay, 
So I'm looking at your answers and most of you are saying W. So most of you think that the white has more green in it. And indeed, most people say that. And it's an intuitive answer. But actually, it turns out that they have equal concentrations. Now, let me explain why this confusion comes about. You see, it is natural to think that the white has more green because when you originally took it, the cup and pour it with the green paint and put it in the white, it was pure green. So you really put the pure green into the white. But when you made a mixture out of it and you put it back into the green, you took some of the white and some of the green back to the green container. So you might think, therefore, there's or the, the green container does not get old white, but gets some green back and therefore white has more green in it. So that's why one reason that people might think white has more green, but conservation and symmetry shows that they are equal and let me explain it. Why is that? You see, we started with equal volume at the beginning and equal volume at the end. So if we exchange what we have switched, would be exactly back to where we started. So let me explain again. We had equal volume to begin with. And then when we put a cup from here into this one and this one back to this one, the final volume was also the same. Now, conservation of green paint and conservation of the white paint says that the total volume of the green and the white at the end and at the beginning are still the same. And since the volumes are the same, whatever is missing from the green must be in the white and whatever is missing from the white must be in the green and therefore they are equal. So that, so that illustrates simple ideas where this can be illustrated. Now you can think of it as another example. Suppose you have a deck of cards and you take three of the red, 10 of red and 10 of black, but you take three of the red and put it in the black deck and shuffle it, and then take the three from this mixture and put it back here and shuffle it. This is very similar to the puzzle I just said about the paint. And you can ask which, which pile has more of the other color? Does the red have more black or the black has more red? Of course, they are equal because, because there were 10 cards to begin with and there are 10 cards of black. So whatever is missing from the 10 of the red card, let's say in this case two, must be two blacks because the total volume was the same. Total number of cards were the same. So symmetry between left and right and conservation explains it. You see the idea of conservation and things sounds obvious, but when you think of it this way, some puzzle which is, looks amazing and difficult to solve suddenly becomes easy. Now, Conservation law and symmetries had also been thought by, by Greek philosophers and mathematicians. Uh, and, and also later on by people like Galileo. So let me explain an example where Galileo tried to correct some of the things that these uh, Greek uh, mathematicians and philosophers had said. Aristotle had believed that heavier objects fall faster. So if you have two objects and you drop them, he said, well, if you drop them from the same height, let it go, they fall at the same time. But if you have a heavier object and a lighter object, he said that the heavier object will fall first. That's what Aristotle said. Now, this sounds reasonable, right? If you think about a big stone and a little pebble, you might think that the big stone will hit first. But Galileo didn't agree. Galileo said all objects fall at the same rate. Now, you might think, what does this have to do with symmetry? This is how Galileo explained it. First of all, he did experiments to prove this point. He went on top of the Pisa tower and dropped heavier and lighter stones and they all dropped more or less at the same time. But they asked the, the people around him, the scientists told him, no, 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 you have to give us an explanation of why it has to be like this. This sounds bizarre. So then he explained it using symmetries in the beautiful way. He said, suppose you have, you have three bricks, three bricks, the same height and the same size, and you drop them. Which one falls first? Well, of course they should fall at the same time. 
because symmetry tells you that because they are same mass and the same height. So therefore by the symmetry, namely you can translation, translate, move the brick from one side to the other and they have exactly the same mass. Therefore they should fall at the same time. So everybody said, yes, yes, we know that that's obvious. What, so what, what does it have to do with heavy objects? He said, well, before we get to heavy objects, suppose you move the height and you, you, you change, you, sorry, suppose you move the bricks, but don't change the height. Does it change how fast they fall? For example, suppose I bring this a little bit closer to this one, like, um, like this one, and then drop it. Then they still fall at the same time. Why? Well, because they're the same height again, obviously. So you say, okay, come on, everybody knows this. So what are we doing from this? Then he made this brief observation. He said, suppose we bring two of the bricks so close together that you can't even tell us one brick or two bricks and then let it fall. Then of course they will fall the same rate again. But now this, this, these bricks are twice more massive than this single brick. So a heavier object, falls at the same rate as the lighter object. This is how he convinced by symmetry arguments that heavier and light objects should appear, should fall at the same time. So these are the kind of intuitions combined with symmetries that physicists love to use. And this is one version that Galileo used. I told you about symmetries, but actually breaking the symmetries is even more fun. It's in fact, not breaking it by hand, but somehow spontaneously, automatically breaking the symmetry. This turns out to be one of the most important principles of modern physics, spontaneous symmetry breaking. And here I'm going to illustrate it by a puzzle. Suppose you have four squares, sorry, four cities on a square, city A, B, C, and D, on four corners of a square. We want to build a highway. We want to build roads which connect all the cities together, but we don't have to necessarily connect directly from each city to every other. As long as you can get from any city to any other city by some way, that is fine. We want to make the total length of the highway to be as short as possible because it costs money to build the highway. So the question is, what is the shortest highway system that can connect all the four cities together? All the ways are equal. Sorry? Uh, all the ways will be equal. Well, let's see, we'll get to this, but let, let me ask the question. I will ask the question in a second. So, um, so let's go here. How many of you think this is the shortest path connecting all the cities? Say why for yes. An N for no, if you don't think that's the answer. So please write it in your chat. If you think this, this thing that I'm drawing here, connecting it like this is the shortest one, say Y. And if you don't think that's the right one, say N for no. Okay, I only see two answers. Okay, more, three answers, good. Please don't be shy, please participate. I need your help. Okay, the answer is, I guess, no. How about this one? Is this the shortest? If you think it's yes, put Y. If no, say no, N. Okay. Yes, of course it's not because for example, you can remove this one and they're still the same. Every, you can still go from C to D by going this way. How many of you think this is the shortest one now? Put Y for yes and for no. Okay, so again, everybody says almost no. And if you can move this line down here, it doesn't change anything, but it turns out that if you bend them, the roads like this with 120 degree angle, this is the shortest system. This is surprising. This is surprising to be the shortest system because if you wanna go from the city A to city B, it takes longer than to go from city A to city C, even though the distance between A and C and A and B are equal because they were on the corner of a square. So in other words, the road system 
has broken the symmetry between A, B, and A, C. So we don't have the full symmetry of the square anymore. The highway system, which is the shortest rows that you can build, gives you a solution which is breaks the symmetry. This is called spontaneous symmetry break. Now, actually, Greek philosophers had actually understood the importance of symmetry breaking. So let me try to explain how they had understood that this is an important concept. First of all, they, they were very smart. They had already discovered that the earth is round and they thought that the earth is at the center of the universe. And they thought it's not moving. So they, because they looked around and nothing seemed to move. So it doesn't move like this. Now, but they wanted to explain why is it not moving? Well, this is how they argued. They said, if it were to move in some direction, it breaks the symmetry because when it was at the center, there was a rotational symmetry in all directions. Picking a direction to move would break that symmetry. So they argued that because you have a symmetry, the symmetry prevents it from moving. That was their argument. So breaks symmetry and therefore they said it's not allowed. This was a, their attempt to use symmetries to explain why something doesn't move. Aristotle was very smart. He said, this is not a good argument. Now, how did he convince them that this is not a good argument? He tried to argue that symmetric situations are not always the best solutions. Sometimes you have to break the symmetry. And the way he argued was like this. Suppose you are at the center of a circle and you have put food, bread around the circle, but you're at the center of the circle. Are you going to stay at the center of the circle and not go and grab some food? Or you're going to go and get some bread from one of these points on the circle, even though you're moving in that direction breaks the circular symmetry, because you have to pick one of the points on the bread. In other words, if you're at the center, you pick some of the bread and you go towards it to eat it. Otherwise, you'll die. So therefore, Aristotle said, breaking the symmetry sometimes is preferred. You won't stay in the circle just because somebody told you it's good to be in the symmetry point. You say, no, it's not good to be in symmetry point. You go and get the food. So he argued, therefore, symmetric point is not always preferred. In fact, our body has broken the symmetry. You see, we live on the earth and if you 360 degree rotational symmetry on the earth, but your eyes are not 360 degrees around the head. Your eyes are only in the front, not all over your head. So therefore, your, your body, your eyes will break the symmetry of 360 degree rotation to an approximate Z2 symmetry, which is the reflection symmetry of left and right. So, which is not exactly there, but approximately there. So why did it break it? Well, because it was evolution decided that this is not an optimal situation. Why? Why is it not optimal? Well, because if you're at the center of the circle, and if there's a food, you see the food and you want to go towards the food. So it's more useful to, to know where you're going. So, so having the eyes all, in, all around you is not as useful as having eye in the front to see where you're going to head to get that food. So breaking of the symmetry is also so fundamental. It's on our bodies. In fact, the modern, you might say, well, what does this have to do with physics? Well, it turns out that modern application of symmetry breaking has explained the, one of the most important discoveries of recent years, which is the Higgs particle which explains why every particle has some mass. So why electron has a mass, why proton has a mass, and so on, is explained by the Higgs, Higgs particle, which is a manifestation of the symmetry breaking. And so the way we think about that in physics is that we have some kind of a potential, somewhat analogous to kind of a, like a valley and a hill. So suppose you're at the top of the hill like this person is, 
Of course, it's not preferred because if you have like a person there or a ball here, it will roll down to a lower point on the valley, even though it's not symmetric anymore. It turns out something like this happens for the Higgs particle and the masses of all the particles is proportional to the distance between the ball and the center of the circle. So therefore the fact that the center is the, which is because of the fact that the lower potential is preferred also explains why we particles get mass. Okay, now you might think that simple mathematics is boring, you know? In primary school, you learn simple mathematics and everybody knows simple things, but it should be boring and you really need fancy mathematics to describe. So I'm going to explain some powerful things about simple mathematics that you'd learn in primary school, not even in high school, in primary school. So let's review. Suppose you consider the earth and the equator. So this white thing is here is the equator of the earth. In fact, this white thing is more than that. It's a belt. Take a belt and wrap it around the equator of the Earth. Okay. Now, open up, open up this belt. It becomes some length here. So this length is equal to the perimeter of the equator. Now, we're going to add one meter to this belt. So we added one meter. One meter, tiny little one meter. And then we wrap it around the earth again. Now, the earth does not, this belt is not gonna be tight on the equator. It's gonna stand a little above the equator. So in fact, it's gonna be some height above the equator. Let me call it X. How many of you think that the X is less than one millimeter? If you think X is less than one millimeter, put Y in the chat. And if you think no, put N in the chat. How many of you think X is less than one millimeter? Put Y. And how many think it's more? Put N. Okay. So some say no, some say yes. Okay, well, so, so, so naively, most people usually think it's yes. And the reason is because you think that you have a huge equator, huge belt, adding a tiny little length to it can hardly change anything. So therefore you might think it's just gonna be a tiny microscopic movement above the equator, but actually, Simple mathematics, in fact, primary school mathematics will convince you that's much, much bigger than one millimeter. In fact, if you take the original circumference is two pi r, if r is the radius of the earth, that was the original length of the equator, you add one meter to it, and that's gonna be two pi times the r plus x, which is the new radius. So two pi r is canceled from both sides and you get one is two pi x. So x is one over two pi, which is about 16 centimeters. Okay, so this is simple math, but somewhat surprising that it's this, um, that it's this big. Now, here I have wrapped the equator, uh, wrapped the belt around the equator in such a way that this distance x is the same everywhere. Of course, I can do something else. I can pull it one side, Put it on one side and, uh, and make it snug on the other side. So, so you see what I'm saying, right? I can make it, I can, pull the, I can pull the belt on one side so it attaches to the rest of the equator and then I can pull this a little more out. How many of you think if I do that, the X is now gonna be uh, Less, uh, less than, uh, is it gonna be less than one meter or more than one meter? How many think it's gonna be, those who think it's gonna be less than one meter, put Y, and those who think it's gonna be more than one meter, put no, N. So Y or N. If, if, if I pull it one way, is it gonna be less than one meter, put yes, 
or Y. And if you think it's going to be more than one meter, put no, N. So one said yes and one said no so far. Okay. Okay, how many people think it's going to be less than 10 meters? If you think it's less than 10 meters, put Y. If you think it's more than 10 meters, put no. How many think it's going to be less than 100 meters? If you think if I do that, how many think less than 100? If you think it's going to be less than 100 meters, put yes. And if you think it's going to be more than 100 meters, put no. Okay. Well, I think, I think that a majority are saying yes, but there are few who say no. And surprisingly, the answer is 121 meters. So if you pull it one side, surprisingly, it's 121 meters. You might find this baffling. This one it requires a little bit more math. You can use calculus to do this. So if you're familiar with calculus, I recommend this exercise for you. So it shows that sometimes simple enough mathematics, in this case, slightly more than elementary, namely calculus is used, give you highly unintuitive answers. Adding one meter to the belt causes it to rise 121 meters. So the next thing I want to describe is the power of continuity. Laws of physics are based on continuous equations and they have typically continuous answers. Continuity means things don't jump up and down. They just smoothly go up and down. They cannot be just jumping up and down. And continuity is also a very important concept in mathematics. So here I want to illustrate some power of this combining continuity into physical setup. Again, let's go back to the earth and consider the equator. Imagine measuring the temperature of the earth around the equator. The temperature will vary, generally speaking, around the equator. It doesn't have to be the same temperature. It could be up, down, and so forth. Now, how many of you think that, but one thing we know is that the temperature doesn't jump up and down. It will smoothly go up and down. It doesn't jump up and down, so it's continuous. How many of you think that at any moment, regardless of what the temperatures are, there are always two points opposite across the center of the earth, which have the same temperature, like this. Like, could there be two, could, is it true that always there are at least two points, there are at least two points opposite relative to the center of the earth, which have exactly the same temperature? Those who think this is always possible say why, and those who think no, it's not, it's not necessary that there always exist such points, put no. Okay, so some say yes, some say no, and it turns out the answer is indeed yes. And to see that, the argument is based on continuity. It is not related to physics so much other than continuity. So consider temperature at opposite points. I call opposite points theta and minus theta. So define a function, which is the difference of the temperature of opposite points. If this function is zero for any, any point, then if they are zero at any point, then the temperatures are equal at opposite points. But suppose, but, but moreover, notice that whatever this f is, if you go to the opposite point, if you go to f of minus theta, it becomes minus itself because you're just switching the order of the two temperatures. So the, this function f at opposite points pick up a minus sign. Now suppose the temperature here is above here then that means F is positive over here. But that means also that F over here is negative because the temperature here minus here is negative. So as you go from this point to this point over here, F goes from a positive number to a negative number. But by continuity, 
if a function goes from positive to negative, it should be zero somewhere. And so wherever that is zero is, that's where the temperatures of the opposite points are the same. In other words, if you go from positive to negative, at some point, you will cross zero. And at that point, F is zero. And when the F is zero, the temperature of opposite points are the same. So this shows the power of continuity, which might suggest that you actually have a physical reason, a deep physical reason why temperatures are the same at opposite points for some, for some pair of points, but it's simply power of continuity. In fact, an interesting fact is that if you consider the temperature and pressure on the earth, at any moment, there are two points opposite to each other on the earth which have exactly the same temperature and pressure. During the day, but there's at least two points at any moment for which the temperature and the pressure are identical, opposite from each other relative to the center of the earth. Again, this follows from continuity, but I won't explain the argument. Now, I would like to describe one of the things about uh, so, I, by the way, I, I just wanted to mention that I'll be very happy to answer questions at the end of my talk. So please, by all means, ask the questions when, when the talk finishes. I'll be very happy to answer. So um, let me talk about gravitational lensing. Um, the gravitational lensing is another example of power of continuity. So what is gravitational lensing? Well, as I was mentioning, Einstein discovered that the geometry of space and time is curved due to matter, but that curvature causes the light rays to bend as they move. So it could be that one star or one galaxy, which sends light towards us on the earth, sends light in two different paths that gets to us at the same point. So if we are sitting on the earth, we watch the galaxy, we think the galaxy is over here or over here, we might think there are two different galaxies, but actually they are the same galaxy because of this, this lensing. This is called the gravitational lensing. So for example, in this picture, you consider this picture, you might see there are many different objects here, but it turns out, that in that area, there are the, all the blue circles here, these five guys are all the same quasar. And all these three one, three orange circles are all the same galaxy. So they are the same galaxy, but their light gets to us in different paths. And it fools us to think they are different objects. Notice that there are five and three, these odd numbers. And in fact, this, there's a good reason. It turns out, that the number of gravitational images is always odd, assuming that the light doesn't get blocked. Generically, they're always odd. And moreover, just less than half of them are inverted images. So you get, you get for example, if you have three images, two of them are normal and one of them is reflected. Or if you have five images, three of them are normal and then two of them are inverted. Now, you might think that this is a very difficult thing to establish using Einstein's equations. Very difficult. However, it turns out to be, again, follows from the power of continuity. And the idea is that if you look at the maps, so this is going to be a little bit more difficult, but I will try to explain it. If you look at the map from the start or some galaxy to us, these light rays that you get gives you a map as as a, from a sphere around the star to a sphere near us. So if you take a big sphere, which passes near us, who centers that galaxy, and consider a small sphere who centers that galaxy, each light ray will cross one point on the small sphere and some other point on the big sphere. So if you look at the point we are at, which is here, if you just get one line coming here, you just get one image. If there's more than one light coming here, you get more than one image. So you get a map, what we call mathematicians call map, from a two-dimensional sphere, which we call S2, to this bigger one, which is a two-dimensional sphere which passes by the Earth. Now, mathematicians define the degree of a map as follows. They say, look at every, any point on this uh, space, 
and look at the number of points that goes, number of light ray maps that go to it. So the degree of a map is the net, is the net number of pre-images of a given point counted with a plus sign if the map is not inverted and a minus sign if it's inverted. So that's the definition of a degree. And the degree of the map when there is no matter is one. Why is that? Well, because the, each light gets there and hits you there. Each one goes over and gets, gets over there. But, but let's see what happens if there is matter. If there is matter, it actually distorts the geometry. And it could be that now the lights, you see if the light source can get here from crossing this circle, just one point. So for example, here, you can get different number of images. Here, get one light, one image here, but the pre-images over here will be three, one, two, three, but one, two of the, one of them is, and the other one is in the same direction, but the other one is goes the opposite one. So the other one is now it's five of them, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, depends on whether you're going in the direction of going around the circle or opposite directions. And so here you would get five images with three right side up and two inverted. So it's a power of continuity which gives you this. You can go from one to three to five, et cetera. Now I want to give you an example of a power of abstraction. Not everything is sometimes simple in mathematics. You have to abstract it somehow. So here I want to give you a puzzle. We have four ants. So ants are moving on a plane. Ants are moving in different directions and at different velocity, different speeds, but each one is a constant speed. So they don't speed up or slow down. So the ants are going at a constant velocity. Now, when the ants cross each other, one could go ahead of the other one, but it turns out that all the ants actually collide and pass through each other. So they pass actually collide. So suppose out of the four ants that we have, three of them, so all pairs collide except for one pair, which we do not know if they collide or not. So let's look at it. So here we have these four ants, they are moving and they collide. You see, they collide, they collide, they collide, they collide, they collide. So all of them collide. We do not know if these last two are going to collide or not. Do you think, do they have to collide? Do these ants have to collide? If you think they have to collide, put yes for Y for yes. And if you think they don't have to collide, put N for no. Okay. Okay, so some people say yes, some people say no, and some people says depends on uh, depends on other conditions that we haven't set. Okay, very good. So now I will explain what the answer is. The answer is they will always collide. Now, how do you see this? It turns out the way to see it is by abstraction. We will see that the plane is two dimensional, but we now add the time coordinate. So we took two space and then we add time. So the sp you take space and time together, space time. Now, the ants are going with constant velocity on the plane, which means that at any given time, if you draw the position of the ant, it will give you a straight line in three-dimensional space. So, so what we call the word line of the ant is a straight line in space time. Is that clear, I hope? So each, since the velocity of ants are constant, the word line of the ants are straight lines. Now, so we have, so each ant, so there are four ants and each one is gonna give you a straight line. So we have four straight lines. But if ants pass through the same point at the same time, that means their lines cross in space time because they pass from the same point at the same time. So therefore, out of those four lines, all pairs, intersect each other except for one pair, possibly. The question is, does that pair also have to intersect or not? And that's simple geometry that you can easily convince yourself that it has to collide, that it has to intersect. So let me explain it. 
So you make the, you add the time coordinate here, and these ants are going on the constant velocity so it correspond to straight lines. So you see, as they collide, they cross each other, and they find that they will have to make, that these will have to also be on the same plane. So you see, they will necessarily be the same plane. In other words, the fact that this forms a plane, because when the lines cross, if any three lines cross, they form a plane. So these form a plane, the, the two, three, and four form a plane. The one, three, and four form a plane. That means the line one and the line four are both on the same plane. And since they are not parallel, they will have to collide. We assume that the ants are moving in non-parallel directions. So again, here it shows that abstraction, in this case, adding the time coordinate was Another thing, puzzle I want to, fact I want to tell you about nature is duality. This is one of the most important things we have discovered in string theory, that there is duality. Duality says that two seemingly different systems can nevertheless be identical. And this typically involves a change of perspective. You have to look at it differently so that they actually become the same. An example of this is this drawing. It's this famous drawing of Escher. You see, if you look at this corner of the drawing, you see the black birds are going in a white sky. And over here, you have a white bird going on a dark night. But you see this white, white birds here are coming from the white sky up here. And the black sky here is coming from the black birds. Gradually, it morphs. In fact, that's left to right, but you can go up and down. And if you go from white birds down, you get to white fields. And the black fields come from the black birds up here or the black night, depends on which way you think about it. So duality, namely going left, right, up, down, changes the perspective and leads to a beautiful consistency of all these viewpoints in different corners. And this is the kind of things we have seen in physics very often, that, that, that pieces of reality morph into different pieces of reality. So here is the puzzle for you. We have one meter stick, a meter stick, one meter long. And we put 20 ants, 20 ants on the meter stick. One meter with 20 ants. And we tell ants to move. The ants either go to the left or to the right. The speed of all the ants are equal. All the ants go with one centimeter per second. Every second they move one centimeter, either to the left or to the right. The ants, if the ant starts going, let's say, from one direction to the other, and one ant goes the other way, they continue going the directions until they collide. When they collide, they reverse direction and they go back with the same speed, one centimeters, but they go back until they collide with another ant. If they collide with another ant, then they collide, they go back again. I hope that is clear. Now, what we want to do is we want to put the 20 ants on the meter stick in such a place and tell them which direction to go at initially so that the so that when the ants fall so i forgot to say one thing when the ants get to the end of the meter stick they fall off so if the ant gets to the end of the meter stick they just fall off the meter stick what we want to do is to put the ants somewhere so that they collide enough so that they fall from the meter stick as late as possible okay we want to make that to be as late as possible. So you have these ants colliding. You see these ants colliding, and then they reverse directions. And when they get to the, to the right side, the, the left side, etc., they fall off. And here they're colliding. So then the question is, where do you put the ants? And which directions should they initially move so as to maximize the time the last ant is on the meter stick? Now, it's difficult, perhaps, to show exactly where they are. So let me ask the question. How many of you think we should put most of the ants near the center? Say Y for yes, N for no. How many of you, okay, thank you. How many of you think, uh, no, it doesn't matter where you put the ants at all.
Say yes for it doesn't matter and for no, it does matter. So it does matter, you think. How many of you think it's enough to put one ant in some particular place and that doesn't matter for the rest? If you think just, if you put one ant in the right place, that's good enough, put Y. And if, if you don't think that's the right answer, put no, N for no. Okay, so some say yes, some say no. Okay, so this is the answer now. The answer is, we're going to use um, the following picture. You see, I told you that the ants have different colors, but if you check the color, when you have two black ants colliding and going back in the other direction, you wouldn't be able to tell if they're colliding and going back or they're going through each other. So you see, for example, here, are the ants going through each other or just colliding and going back? It doesn't make a difference. So you have done a duality. You have transformed the ants going this way to the ants colliding and passing through each other. Two different physical situations are identical as far as where the ants are. Therefore, all you have to do is to start with one ant in one corner and tell it to go to the right. And it doesn't matter where you put all the rest of the ants. So it takes 100 seconds because that ant goes one centimeter per second. It is possible that that ant goes back and forth, but at least the trajectory of it will continue all the way to the other side. So again, now here we use the power of duality. Okay, <clears throat> so this is going to be my last puzzle. I know I just ran out of time, so I'm going to end with this last puzzle. And this is one of my favorite puzzles because it reflects on scientific methodology. It teaches us something about how scientists think. We first come up with examples or what we call experiments. Then we formulate general principle based on examples. And then third, we come up with arguments why and how it works. And of course, we continue experimenting and checking and checking. So here is our experiment or our example. Suppose we have a circle. There's one region here, good. Now, suppose we put two points on the border of the circle and we connect them. How many regions do we get? Well, we get two regions, region one, region two. So with two points on the circle, you get two regions, one, two. Suppose you have three points and you connect all points together. How many regions do you get now? Well, you get four points, four regions. One, two, three, four. So with three points, you get four regions. Okay. Let's do four points. And then let's connect them. How many regions do we get now? Of eight, eight regions, four inside here and four in the boundaries there. So you get two points, you get two regions, three points, you get four regions, four points, you get eight regions. I'm putting these points in random points, random positions, generic positions, what we call. I don't want to fine tune them. So just put generic positions, random, not symmetric positions, just generic positions, and count the regions you get. So do you see any pattern here? How many thinks that if I put five points, they're gonna be, how many think it's gonna be 10 regions? Say yes, why? And if you think no, say N. How many think if I have five points, I get 10 regions? Say Y for yes and N for no. Okay. How many think if I put five, points, I get 16 regions. If you think that's yes, put yes, and if n, no. Okay, so you're correct, it's 16. So when somebody says it depends on location, yes, but I'm taking generic locations. 
So if you take generic points, it's 16. I'm taking generic one. You can always choose some funny points so that you get less, but, but I put it generic position and then it's 16. So, so we get two points, give you two regions, three points, four regions, four points, eight regions, five points, 16 regions. Do you see the pattern? Exactly, somebody wrote two to the n minus one. Why, why is it like this? Well, you might think that each time you're drawing a line, it's going to be either the left side or the right side. So come exactly, combinatorics, good. So how many is going to be six points? What's the answer for six points? Just write the number in the chat. Exactly, everybody knows. So, so if you put six points, this is the answer. Thirty-one. I'm sorry to tell you, it is not thirty-two. We all made a mistake. There is no mistake in counting, and I did not put the points in funny positions. I put it in generic position, and the answer is thirty-one, not thirty-two. Our experiment showed that we were making a mistake. Our theory failed. The theory of two to the n minus one sounded like a good theory. It almost worked. We had an explanation. We had a theory. It was wrong because further experiment prove it's false. You can check for your, your own drawing that's in D31. And the exact formula turns out to be one. The number of regions is one plus n choose two plus n choose four and not two to the n minus one. So for example, if you have seven points, the answer is 57 regions. So here it shows us that mathematics can kind of cleanse our intuition. And sometimes we cannot jump to conclusions and we have to do more and more experiments to confirm the reality. And that's what science is. I hope I have conveyed the power of simple mathematical ideas in the context of physics. Even the most advanced ideas in string theory have simple mathematical underpinnings, just like the puzzles we have discussed, discussed today. And thanks again for listening to my talk. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, it's very, very nice puzzles, uh, very interesting. And uh, I'd like to give a few moments for the audience to type their question. And maybe since you can read it, Professor, you can maybe pick out a few questions that uh, would be nice. If, if anybody has any questions, please just uh, write your question down in the chat. And uh, actually, they, is it possible for them to just directly ask me if they wish? Yeah, if, if you want to just directly yes, I'd ask. Love to, I'd love to hear it from your voices. And yeah, if, you open, that. If, if, you, if you open your videos, that'll be best. If you don't like to open your video, you can just talk, whichever you prefer. So whoever wants to ask a question, unmute yourself and ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. That is, okay. that is. How do you think? Yeah, how do you think what is more important? It's talent or hard work? Uh, both are important, but, but uh, uh, Edison had a famous statement saying it's 99% perspiration and only 1% inspiration. So some people who have done actually the work say that it's, it's more hard work. <laughs> I think it's both. Okay, All thank right. you. Welcome. Next question. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. This is Bek Mukhatar. Bek Mohammed. Bek Mohammed. Yes. What, what ad advanced topics of ad uh, mathematics is used in physics? Almost every, every topic of advanced mathematics come to be used in physics. It's surprising. When I was a graduate student, there were some areas that were not used, but as we have learned more and more modern mathematics, more and more, and more, more and more modern physics, more and more modern mathematics has entered. So by now, almost all mathematics is being used. Some used more, some used less, but all of them are being used. Differential geometry, for example, the group theory, number theory, you name it, they're all in. Okay, next question. If you had the opportunity to ask science one question, what would be and 
What kind of a question? A question to, about science or from science? Can you repeat your question again? About science. If, if I were had to ask... Opportunity, opportunity I, mm -hmm. ask yeah. a science could be and what kind of, what kind of a question? If I ask a scientist a question, what the question would be and who it would be? Yes. I wouldn't ask a scientist a question though, but you're giving me the opportunity. I would, I, I would hope that, I would ask nature that question. The scientists are making mistakes. You know, we just went through these examples together and we saw we made mistakes. So actually this is a good question. So that let me elaborate. For example, Einstein, you know, amazing scientist. He remarkably shaped the modern conception of space and time. Brilliant mind. He made so many mistakes. He did not like holes existed. He did not believe that. He made a lot of mistakes. Being a brilliant mind does not make it, does not make it that you don't make mistakes. So you're always possibly, you can always make mistakes. So I don't trust scientists. I only trust nature. And I think that's my attitude. So for me, scientists are not the main source. Scientists are fallible like myself. We make mistakes, but nature is what we are looking for. So therefore I'm not looking for asking my questions from scientists. I look for my asking my question from nature. Yeah, can I? Yes, Muka. is it Muka yeah, uh, what breakthrough discoveries in science should we expect in the next 10 years? Well, it's difficult to predict. Um, I mean, I mean, first of all, if your question is about all of science, like including, you know, biology, you know, chemistry, everything. No, in if you're physics. asking specifically about physics, I would say that I think that some of the discoveries might have to do with the early properties of early universe and the nature of dark energy. My suspicion is we're going to learn something about that in the next 10, 15 years, but, uh, but it's too early to say. So I would imagine that some of the big mysteries of early universe, what happened just before the big bang or what is happening now and how much, how much more is left from the lifetime of our universe, because we do know that our universe is going to decay. How much lifetime does it have? What is the lifetime? Can we relate that to dark energy and those features? So I think there are, there are things like that, which I think is going to, going to be uh, hopefully understood a little more clearly. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Who, uh, who or what influences your decisions to push science? Who or what? Okay, so when I was, I think, uh, like eight years old, I used to look at the moon and I was asking, why doesn't this thing up there fall down? Who's holding this moon up there? And this was bothering me. So I, was, I would ask people around me, do you know why this doesn't fall down? And you know, the adults and so on would answer me, you know, uh, actually, you know, this thing, gravity keeps it up there. And then I didn't understand what that meant. I said, oh, there's this fancy thing is keeping it up there and I don't see it, it's very strange. So I was always mesmerized by these magical things like, you know, air, moon is up there, it doesn't seem to fall and things like that. And then there were questions that I cannot explain why I was curious, but I was always curious. For example, I remember I was in the third grade in primary school and my teacher told me, was teaching us about the concept that things have height, depth and width. So there are three things, height, depth and width. Well, our teacher didn't say there are three dimensions, but she, she was basically trying to familiarize herself with the height, width, the width and the, the depth, just these concepts. And I remember asking, why are there three of them? Why are they not less than three or more? Why three? What, what, where did that three come from? It bothered me. Now, this is a strange thought for a primary school kid to get bothered by it. But now, you know, in the context of string theory, in retrospect, that's an important question. So I don't know somehow why I was attracted to these kind of, you might think crazy questions, but somehow it attracted me. And these were the beginning of my getting interested in, in, in understanding nature. But the moment that I got to learn that mathematics can actually predict concrete things, like you can use math to find out where the ball falls if you get it with a given speed. 
up there, the trajectory, which trajectory it takes. Just by simply writing on a piece of paper and just doing simple math, you can tell where that thing is gonna fall over there. That remarkable link between writing math thing on a piece of paper and that ball falling there was to me amazing, that power of mathematical thinking. So when I saw that, I said, that's it. I really love to learn more and more about this. And then I learned about special relativity, relativity of time and the fact that you know time, time slows down or the lengths contract, these amazing stuff. So I, I, was, just, I was just hooked. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry, I have a question. Yes, please. How can people benefit from the results of your research? Uh, good question. First of all, unfortunately, the, the, the area I'm working on, string theory, has not been experimentally verified. And for something to have technological applications, you need... Ex Unfortunately, the strings are too tiny to be able to see, and the experiments, they do not have enough energies to probe that small structure. So therefore, direct applications of what I'm doing to technology will not happen in our lifetime. So of course, long in the future, hopefully there will be applications, most probably there will be, but you might ask, what, does it, what do I do in my lifetime? Or what, what am I doing? What benefit does it, what benefit my research does in my lifetime? to people who are not necessarily physicists. Well, this is one of the reasons I love to give public lectures about what we have discovered in string theory. So explaining facts that we have learned is always satisfying for us. I mean, humanity likes this bigger ideas of what is going on in the universe. And so this connection with the bigger thing around us is important. So it doesn't give you tangible technology. It doesn't give you extra, you know, uh, commodities or money or anything, but gives you some more uh, clarity in thinking about where we are, how long do we have to live, where did the universe start from, these kind of bigger questions. I have a question. Yes. Uh, what do you like to do in your free time? In my free time, um, Let's see, other than listening to COVID news. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> hopefully everybody is doing safely there and keeping safe with masks, which I'm, I'm hoping will hopefully be able to defeat this virus soon. But apart from the strange times like now, if I'm in regular times, I love to listen to music, for example. That's one of my habit, uh, hobbies. I love music. I love swimming. I do sports. Uh, I occasionally enjoy watching movies, reading books. Yeah, those kind of things. Yes, uh, Hirsch index is important for scientists. Sorry, repeat the question again. Is a uh, Hirsch index important for scientists? Hirsch, uh, H index, you mean? Yes, yes. No, it's not. It's not. It's H index just reflects how many people people think that it's a measure of how much you have been productive. But uh, I don't think that is the right way to judge a science. You might have written only one paper, which affects the whole, whole uh, incredible uh, areas in physics, but then your H index will only be one. So, so not necessarily. It's just a measure of, of productivity and your recognition, but I don't think that's, um, that's, that's a good judgment. Mm. Uh, hello? Uh -huh. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Uh, your uh, uh, our phys physicists um, after learning a lot of things, they started to believe in God. Do you believe in God? You see, the I think first of all, I, I distinguish between science and religion. Uh, I do not connect the two together. They're two different facets of life. Um, I think that we have scientists who are very religious, deeply devoutly religious, like Newton. Newton was very religious. He would say that, you know, the reason he studied mechanics was to show the power and glory of God. That was Newton. So Newton was really religious. In fact, he has written more about Christianity than he has written about physics. On the other hand, there are people, other physicists like Hawking, 
and others who have a different view. And they don't view religion as a center of the, uh, or God or whatnot as a center of the science. They have different viewpoints. So, and, and if you ask, for example, somebody like Einstein, what did he think? Again, you have another example, like, uh, at, you know, he said he didn't believe in conventional definition of religion or God, but he believed that there is a sense in which there is this higher religiosity, which is the consistency or the overarching structure of this reality or the fundamental laws of nature that he identified with a religion. So when you say whether or not scientists believe in God or religion, I think it depends on what you mean by that, because the interpretation of that could be different. So, so scientists who want to say yes will interpret the, the religion in such a way that the answer is yes, and someone say no because they have a different interpretation of the meaning of that word. But I, I believe, if you ask me, I believe that there is a sense in which all the scientists are religious in sense. It's not the same, but there is a sense in which they are religious. And you might ask why, how do I know this? Well. Scientists are looking for answers to something. They are looking for reality. So they believe there is something out there to be discovered. Where, why do they believe there's pattern? Why do they believe there's a structure? That's a religious view, view. That's a religious view. That view is some thinking that they are putting beyond this. It's, it's more than this. They're looking for simplicity. Why should it be? Why should the nature be simple? It could be very complicated and chaotic. They're looking for such pattern. So there's a sense in which scientists, just by looking for it, that very act is a religious act. Thank you for the answer. And uh, from what, uh, from your presentation, uh, I think um, that, uh, do you believe that the mass is the queen of the scientific subjects? Mass is, is the subject of scientific subject, mass? Yes, is the queen of the uh, scientific subject that you have to um, know the math before you learn other oh, math. things. Math, oh yes, you're asking whether math is the queen of science, uh, like Gauss used to think. I think math is, is part of every science, so certainly I believe that. I mean, but for me, math is nothing but logical, logically consistent statements or related relation of objects which are consistent with each other is for me math. So in some sense, math is the language of science. It's like, it's like saying that without language, could you convey thoughts? It's very difficult. Math to me is the, the language for science. Uh, thank you question. for the answer. How can we learn about black holes if the traps light and um... We can actually be. Uh, it can't actually be seen. How we can learn about black holes? About black holes. Well, black holes cannot be seen, but we can see what falls into them, because as they are falling, they before they go inside, they radiate, and so by the pattern of the radiation and all that well, things are falling, we learn something about black holes. That's one thing we learn. Now, mm -hmm. There's another thing we have learned about black holes by studying it theoretically, which is the fact that they decay. They, they, they emit what's called talking radiation. This is very slow process. So none of, and it's so little that radiation that's very difficult to detect. So it's theoretical now, but some of these consistency conditions of black holes have led to deeper understanding of gravity and quantum aspects of gravity. So, so physical black holes have led to thought experiments which have deeply impacted all of physics. So black holes are among the most important objects to think about in theoretical physics. And a lot of my time is spent on thinking about black holes in different forms. Any question? I, yes, I have a question. Yes. Um, how do you think, uh, is it really important uh, for you that you, your university have a good funding for new ideas and for discoveries, or you need to just have a pen and the paper and maybe computer to make some breath, breakthrough ideas and discoveries? Yes, I think this is a very good question. You see, um, it is difficult to answer your question because what is what I really need is a good environment. I don't need I don't need too much money other than you know computer or blackboard and so on. But, but I need good colleagues. I need good students. 
these are difficult to get. So it happens to be in place like my university or other universities, which have as our centers of education and centers of interactions, then I benefit. I don't, I mean, you could have like millions of dollars, but don't have any physics around you. It doesn't do you any good. So just giving you money and resources is not useful until you actually materialize it in the form of colleagues, collaborators, and so on. Now, some of my experimental colleagues, physicists who do experiments, sometimes they need huge machines and those cost a lot of money. I'm not talking about those. Since my field is theoretical physics, I don't need money. I need, I, I mean, not much money. Of course, you have, to, you have to have a living and you have, you know, you have the computer and this and that. So it's not too expensive, but more important is the environment. So <clears throat> for example, during the COVID period, I have really missed direct interaction with my colleagues. Now I interact via Zoom and so on, which is not nothing, of course. I'm, I mean, I've continued writing papers and doing research, but just you know, random interactions with colleagues, you know, just going and talking with them, going for a coffee, and so on. Those little interactions really impact advancement of science. Okay, thank you. And my second question that in my country, all of fundamental and applied research uh, are requested to be commercialized. So uh, sometimes it's really difficult to explain for our staff, I mean, for our administration, uh, that uh, some research cannot be commercialized. It's like a theory, some researches. Uh, what would you advise? Uh, how can we attract scientists and attract funding? How can we uh, explain why it's important, why you should give us money just yes, for- Yes, this is a good question. Research. It's a good question. So let me explain, I mean, um, let me explain, uh, explain how I think about it. Um, this actually, Abdul Salam, I don't know if you know him, he's a Pakistani physicist who created this, this amazing center. He's a Nobel laureate in physics from Pakistan who uh, created the center in physics in, in Italy International Center in Theoretical Physics, which attracts, uh, you know, tries to help the third world and the country, countries which are not advanced in science to catch up with the advanced science. They asked him, how do you justify, exactly your question, how do you justify for a country which doesn't have much resources to put money into things like theoretical physics? What is this useful for? Whereas if you take, put that money into, I don't know, building a pump, which can pump the water out of the, you know, the desert or whatever, then it's much more useful. So, so we should get engineers who make that pump rather than getting these people like Kamran Vafa who does string theory, okay? That would be the answer that, that they, would, they would be giving you that that's much more useful. And his answer was this. He said, okay, so suppose you want to get this water out of the desert. You need the pump. And of course you need an engineer, right? Yes, good. So let's get the engineer and let's get the pump. Sometimes the pump might break, okay? Then you have to understand the manual and the engineer might understand some pieces of the manual, but there are pieces which may not be clear how it's working. So if you wanna fix it, you have to really understand that plumbing, how it exactly works. Engineer goes next to somebody who knows a little bit more about the theory of how the plumbing works. He goes a little bit physicists who are applied physicists. Applied physicists, oh, the way the pump works this way, if this is broken, we can do this one. Good. The applied physicist tries to do some calculation. It took hard. Goes to a guy who is more theoretical. A guy who is a theoretical physicist will look at it and say, oh yeah, there's a simple math I can do which gives you a plumbing question and then get stuck. So let me ask my math friend who knows more about this. There's a whole chain which gets connected. It's not easy to distinguish this area. If you compartmentalize to one little thing, you think you have solved one problem, but as soon as a little change happens, you cannot do anything. So it's like change, you have to connect everything together. And so you have to support all these activities and it's a mistake to compartmentalize. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, by addition, how connected are fundamental science and technology? Can we predict that some abstract theories will be applied? For example, no one could uh, predict that very abstract subjects of mathematics like number theory and Boolean algebra will be applied. 
how can we predict it? We cannot predict it. Unfortunately or fortunately, uh, the applications of science is unpredictable, generally speaking. It, it just comes along and you just follow what happens. So the answer is that I do not know how to predict what will come applied. So we just have to learn as much as we can and we have to be open. We have to be open-minded to learn, curious and open-minded. All right, thank you so much. I think uh, we, we are quite over time, but I would love to give the audience maybe one more question before we go. Uh, it, let, let's, give, uh, let's give Professor Vafa one more question. Any, who has a, a final question? Okay, may I ask a question? So, yes. other things or incidents in nature that do not obey the laws of physics? Uh, well, sometimes there are things that do not seem to obey the laws of physics, but that means your laws of physics are incorrect. So, you remember my last puzzle? My puzzle when the, you had six points or whatever points that you had that gave you the wrong answer? That was because the law you had was not was wrong. It wasn't to the n minus one. It was a different number. Now, I will give you an answer which you might su be surprised. Newton, during his time, noticed that one of the planets is not following his laws. And then instead of saying that this will tell us that there's something else around, like there's some other planet around that we are not taking into account, he said something to the effect which, well, it must be that the God has intervened in the laws of science. Because God has the, has the capacity to create the laws, he could say, okay, I'll make an exception. This planet can go the other way. So Newton made such a thing, which from today's perspective looks somewhat strange. We don't take that as an acceptable answer. So if there are things which don't behave like the known science, like the known laws, it is because the known laws are incomplete. We then change or complete our laws to incorporate it. So the answer is no. There's no such thing as something not obeying the correct laws of physics. There are things which do not obey the known laws of physics, but that just means that your laws of physics should be modified to accommodate the correct facts. It's wonderful, wonderful. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. It's, a, it's a, such a pleasure to have you here and to hear your talk and to answer so many good questions. Uh, thank you audience for, for appearing and for giving your attention. And uh, I hope that maybe we could have you back sometime. Thank you very much. I have very much enjoyed your questions. Uh, the young minds is all, always what we need for advancement of science. I hope at least some of you decide to become scientists and help us. And I very much look forward to visiting the beautiful Kazakhstan, hopefully not too, few, too long a future from now. Definitely. Uh, and take Pleasure good care you. of yourselves. Yeah. Bye all right. Everybody. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. События 2020 года. Пандемия. Самоизоляция. Локдауны. Да, но не только они. 2020 год — это плюс 15 тысяч шибановцев. Новые лаборатории и кабинеты. Новые возможности Smart University. Создан автономный образовательный портал с собственной системой прокторинга. Увеличено количество услуг Smart Arsu. Проведена неделя цифровизации. Достижения ученых. Учеными выиграны гранты на 160 миллионов тенге. Под руководством профессора Конышбека Шункеева разработан учебник по физике для школьников Казахстана. Открыт диссертационный совет на соискание степени PHD по филологии. Защищена диссертация по математике. Успехи студентов. Волонтерские организации и школа волонтеров стали лучшими проектами области. Проведен международный студенческий семинар «Перспективы развития студенческого самоуправления в эпоху цифровизации». Участники стартап Академии выиграли гранты на свои проекты почти на 3 миллиона тенге. Международное признание. 
университет стал соорганизатором международной конференции QS. Жбанов Университет впервые вошел в международный рейтинг QS University Ratings и ECA и занял 351 место среди лучших вузов. Год Абая. Имя и наследие Абая стало ближе тысячам казахстанцев. Проведено множество мероприятий и конкурсов. Опубликовано несколько научных трудов. Книга о Байтану передана во все школьные библиотеки области. И, конечно же, 2020 – это юбилейный год университета Жубанова. Проведено 85 благотворительных мероприятий. 503 человека награждены юбилейными медалями. 85 педагогов получили премии от областной профсоюзной организации работников образования и науки. Выпускники Активинской области стали обладателями 85 грантов имени Кудайбергена Шубанова. Зарегистрировано 85 патентов. Учеными факультетами передано в библиотеку по 85 книг. Студентами реализовано 85 стартап-проектов. В 2020 году Шубанов Университет перелистнул 85-ю страницу своей истории, чтобы с новыми целями идти вперед вместе с вами. Армандар алгачи телегенде. Белым житесь таки лоскнда. Шабаттар бергешин долганда. Биек билистерге кадам басканда. Оматулмас сатерге. Уз арманнда баскарабе. Ауезов Университет. Что абитуриент ждет от университета? Знания, опыт. Образование или же студенческую жизнь? Я вам скажу, что КБТУ – это нечто большее. Это активная студенческая жизнь, новые знакомства, новые друзья. Опыт, навыки и знания, которые вы получите здесь, могут стать отличным стартом для вашей карьеры. Также в нашем университете вы можете встретить свою любовь. Теперь немного поговорим про учебную часть. КБТО – это университет, который подготавливает и выпускает элиту Казахстана. Здесь вы можете наблюдать наши тренажеры, здесь студенты тренируются и обучаются. 